trust that everyone had a blessed week this week. Amen. I know that the week is um, sometimes can be challenging, but praise the Lord anyhow, right? Amen. Because we're here, and that's a blessing. Before we start, I'd like to say a prayer. Can we bow? Dear Heavenly Father, we truly thank you for another Sabbath day, Lord, a day of rest and gladness, a day where we can uh, set aside the cares of the world and focus on me. We thank you for your grace, your love, and your mercy, and pray that the services of today may be a blessing to many. Give me the words to say through your Holy Spirit to your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Can everyone turn in their Bibles to Daniel chapter 7? Can you hear me okay? All right. Okay. When you have it, say amen. Okay. I'm going to actually play initially um, the dramatized version of Daniel 7 um, in the King James Version. And uh, if you can't hear me, let, if you can't hear it on the phone, let me know. But I'm going to start there and then we're going to kind of pick apart Daniel 7. I'm oh, sorry. One second. I'm sorry about that. I don't know what's going on exactly. Just one moment. Of course, you know how these gadgets can be at times. I apologize for that, but it went to another book, unfortunately. And uh, we will start. And it's kind of it's kind of lower than I thought it would be. So bear with me. Daniel chapter 7. Stop right there. Okay. So, based on that, and I'm sure you've read Daniel 7 many times, we're going to delve into Daniel 7 and the questions that we have from our Sabbath school lesson and kind of get a little deeper into the uh, actual message behind Daniel 7. We know that uh, prophecy has a way of repeating itself and enlarging. That is the one important principles of prophecy that we need to keep in mind. Can someone please 
for me read Amos 3, 7. If you know it by memory, can you then recite it, please? Amos 3, 7. Does anyone have it? If not, I'll read it. Amos 3, 7. Pastor, go ahead, Pastor. The text says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Amen. So we know by that scripture that God has prophets that he reveals his secrets to. Amen. We know that man in its human flesh is not equal to God, and some things are secret to God. But God has chosen in his infinite wisdom to reveal secrets to his prophets so that we can have a message for our time. Let's also read 2 Peter 1, verses 20 and 21, please. Do I have a reader for that? Second Peter 1, verse 20 and 21. If not, I'll read it. It says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men spoke or spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So we know that all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and that the Holy Spirit has spoken through servants of God to reveal a message Which uh, question is it? Is it here? Mm -hmm. This is the first year of Belshazzar. Offer as associate. Uh, associate king with with the father Nahum, or year five forty B.C.
Yes, of course. basically was more focused on self-gratification and just having a good time. Basically, he did not learn, obviously, anything from Nebuchadnezzar, the lessons that Nebuchadnezzar had to learn the hard way. He did not take heed to those. So too, today, when we look at Let's look at the world, for instance. We have so many lessons that we could draw from in terms of history. And yet, as history repeats itself, so many still haven't learned a lesson at all. They haven't taken hold of the gospel as it is presented to them. Even with all the truths and all the avenues that's available for one to learn, if they choose to, Neglect is still there in terms of taking time to actually embrace the word and learn from past mistakes of others or other generations. Does anyone have anything to add? Uh, what I'd like to say uh, deeper than that, Belshazzar had a rebellious heart. Mm -hmm. It's not that he didn't, he wasn't taught that. His grandfather taught him. He knew. He knew right from wrong. Mm -hmm. The man had a rebellious heart, and I'm going to show the world that, that my, the God that I choose to serve is the most prominent God. And that's why he sent, he was half drunk, but he wasn't that drunk. <laughs> he, sent, he sent his, his uh, colleagues to the house of God to bring home, to bring those, those, those sacred uh, vessels. Yes, mm -hmm. those, and he knew better. Yeah, he did. Not that he didn't know better, but he was rebellious, like so many people today are rebellious. They're going to do it their way in spite of. No matter what. I agree. But could you imagine, even in his drunken state, and probably almost everyone around him was probably in the same state of mind, when they saw that handwriting on the wall, some probably fainted from fear. Some probably left the room, ran out. His knees buckled, you know. So you could imagine what they, what they must have been thinking. They probably thought, hey, man, this is some good stuff, or this is some bad stuff, you know, depending on what they were high on. You know what I'm saying? So, um, so is, it is today that people are so drunk with the cares of the world, with, with various things that they've chosen to embrace, that they can't really see the forest for the tree, tre trees, or they prefer not to see it. Because like you said, they want to do it my way, you know? So they can say, like Frank Sinatra, I did it my way, right? So uh, therefore, there's always a lesson to be learned if we take heed and pay attention to what's going on now. Because as we know, history does repeat itself. Pastor Phillips? I was just gonna say is that this is the reason why God has given us the book of Daniel. Mm -hmm to show us that in spite of ungodly rulers, as is brought out in Daniel chapter four, uh, Belshazzar's grandfather, mm -hmm. Nebuchadnezzar, mm -hmm. had to learn that the most high mm -hmm. ruleth mm -hmm. in the kingdom of okay. men. That's right. And giveth it to whomsoever he will. Exactly. Uh, Psalms 24 verse one says, the earth is the Lord. Mm -hmm. and the fullness thereof, and they right. that dwell therein, its inhabitants. So right. God is in complete control of our earthly history. Mm -hmm. And so he reveals it unto us at certain times to make right. sure that we understand that God alone knows the future. Right, right. And he reveals how he's going to manage the affairs of earth. Exactly. Even when earthly rulers tend to think that they're in that control. They're in control. He sets up kings and he brings them down, right? Uh, I have um, a passage to read here from 
the, the um, story of Daniel the prophet. And it is um, from the Pen of Inspiration, page 89, paragraph 1 says, The seventh chapter of Daniel reveals the future of God's people, not only the Hebrew nation, but the true spiritual Israel. The vision was given to Daniel in the first year of the reign of Belshazzar at about 540 BC, which is what the lesson says. The mere giving of this view bears the strongest testimony to the results of Daniel's education when a youth, to his steadfastness of purpose and his growth in spiritual things. At the age of 85, after 67 years of court life, with all its allurements and the natural tendency of human nature to sink to the purely physical existence, his eye of faith was so undimmed that at the bidding of Michael, Gabriel could carry Daniel into heaven itself, there to behold the Father and Son in that final work of the sanctuary above. That's very beautiful because he was steadfast in his faith. God was able to reveal spiritual things and heavenly things to him because of his faith, because it didn't matter what his environment was. He was determined to do the right thing. So too, we today have choices to make. And in, in, even in the midst of all the chaos, as we can see that's going on, on the news and in the world, every day is something new, so much drama, we have to stay focused on the mark. Amen. You know, so there are signs that God has laid out for us a road map to follow. If we stay on that path, that straight and narrow pathway leading up to the kingdom, we'll be okay, regardless of what we go through. Because we've all been through something. We've all gone through something. But we have to learn from past mistakes, from past history, biblical history specifically. But the Bible definitely ties into history, doesn't it? As we can see. Number two. What effect did this dream have upon Daniel? It kind of gave Daniel a little bit of trepidation and stress, right? Mm -hmm. Daniel was, was grieved. It says, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit. Grieved means like sorrow, distress, heartbroken. And he, he couldn't figure this thing out. Even though in his mind he still had that picture of this image right here. That stayed with him. But now he's seeing these beasts. It's like, how does that tie in? You know, what is the significance? It was in the midst of his body, in the core. He could feel it. You know how sometimes your stomach sinks? Like you feel like your heart dropped down to your, your stomach or your toes? That's the feeling that I'm sure he had when he had that dream. He was troubled just like Nebuchadnezzar was troubled when he had that, that, that vision. When, he, when Nebuchadnezzar had the dream, compared to Daniel's vision, that's what I'm trying to say. Pastor? Okay, um, the image in Daniel 2 gives the flow of human history and what kingdoms would follow thereafter, beginning with the kingdom of Babylon. But actually, it starts earlier dealing with Israel, yes. uh, Assyria, exactly. Egypt, and then we come to Babylon. Right. But in Daniel 7, when you look at those beasts, each of those beasts have specific characteristics. Mm. And it would reveal the type of government right. that each beast would represent. Right. And, and I don't want to get ahead of you, but I'm just no. simply saying is that but, but each right. beast reflects a type of government. Yes. And it's very critical that we understand that because that type of government or what was in each one is still being exposed today. today right. And so, so we can say then, based on that, that comment that the pastor Phillips just made, that these various beasts lifestyles, religious beliefs, their ways of doing things, assimilated from kingdom to kingdom, right? 
Babylon was initially the first kingdom represented here by this line. And I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but just as we go forward, just remember that each kingdom brought something different, like Pastor said, to the people that it governed. Yet their ways, customs, religious beliefs, education, etc., all trickled down. So it was a trickle down effect. They all assimilated into one another, those beliefs, those, the ways they, re, uh, they worshiped and things of that nature. Just keep that in mind. Okay, moving on. Number three, let's just read the note number two, I apologize. It says, the effect of Daniel's dream upon him, it will be noticed was similar to the effect of Nebuchadnezzar's dream upon him. It troubled him. So we know that Nebuchadnezzar's dream troubled him. It troubled him so much that he was willing to pretty much slaughter all his wise men and whatever to get the interpretation. That's how much it bothered him. So if you're willing to do that, you must really be troubled in more ways than one. Okay. So let's move forward. What did uh, Daniel ask of one of the heavenly attendants who stood by him in his dream? So first of all, who's, what is a heavenly attendant? An angel, okay. An angel. And, and we know there's many different angels. There's avenging angels. There's, there's just um, recording angels, guardian angels, ministering angels. What type of angel do you think was, was at Daniel's side at that time? It was Gabriel by name. And what type of angel is Gabriel? <laughs> so is he like an archangel? I mean, what would you say? Ministering angel? Ministering angel. So he was ministering to Daniel at that time? Yes. Okay, so do you think, I know there's, there's various angels, you know, they have various missions and various jobs, just like we have various jobs. Um, so do you think that angels can be interchangeable in terms of their mission? at any given time? Yes. Okay. Just keep that in mind. Okay, so the heavenly attendant who stood by him in his dream says, I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. Okay. So the angel started to unfold this dream to Daniel. And as it unfolded, do you think a light bulb went off in Daniel's head and said, hey, what do you think he was thinking at that time? Anyone want to share what they think? Where was his mindset as, as, as this whole scene unfolded right before his eyes? What, what do you think as, as it was interpreted to him, he thought? Well, in verse uh, 10, it said, A fiery stream issued and came forth before him. Thousand, thousands ministered unto him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. Okay. Go ahead, Pastor. I was going to simply say is that uh, here's what we have to remember, and this goes back to a previous lesson study that we had, I think it was uh, last year. Remember, the children of Israel have been allotted some time that they're going to be in Babylon. How God told them that, that? they'll be there for 70 years. Mm. And so that 70 years is getting close to its end. Mm -hmm. And Daniel is troubled. He's concerned what's going to happen to the people of God. Right. What's going to happen to Israel? And God has a far more bigger picture than mm -hmm. just Israel alone. Mm -hmm. Because at that time, God is dealing with literal Israel. Right. And eventually it's going to change, as we know. To spirit. But I'm just simply mm -hmm. saying that at that time, Daniel is concerned about his people. What's going to happen to them? Mm -hmm. and, so now, and so now God visits him. Through the king, of course, because King Nebuchadnezzar is in charge. Right. And so there's a big picture that God wants Daniel to see rather than just the children of Israel alone. It's right. really concerning us in our time. Right. That's just how far reaching uh, these visions are. Right. Yeah, because God has given us these, uh, these messages and these prophecies 
for our time because he wants us to be prepared. He's not just going to tell you to do something and then leave you without the tools to do it. He's going to make sure that you have everything that you need to accomplish the mission. And what is the mission and what is the goal? What is our mission here on this planet? We talked about it. What is the mission? To spread the gospel throughout the world, right? And then what's going to happen? The end, the end, end will come. come. So our ultimate goal is what? That's our goal. That's our mission. Our goal is to make it to the kingdom, but not alone, right? Amen. Do we want to make it alone? No. I indeed. mean, it'd be pretty, I mean, I'm not going to say you'll be lonely because there's host and host of angels. We can't even number them. Let's face it. And of course, our Lord and Savior is there with our Father. So you won't be lonely, mm -hmm. but who would want to go there alone? I mean, I would love to have some of my loved ones, some of my family, my church family members, you know what I'm saying? I would love to see all of us making it to the kingdom. Mm -hmm. I mean, would you want to be standing on the streets of gold alone or the sea of glass, you know what I'm saying, or walking those streets of gold alone? Just humming a tune. I mean, it would be, <laughs> would be nice just to be there. You know what I'm saying? But I, wanna, I want somebody to go with me. I want a lot of people to go with me. Mm -hmm. And I'm praying that each and every one of us can be a witness to somebody. And mm -hmm. some small, even the smallest little thing that we think is insignificant is important to God. You know, I don't care. Even your witness, your testimony is important. In fact, my grandmother used to always say, I'd rather... See a sermon and to hear one any day. Yes. The life that we lead is very important. What people see of us is very important. Go ahead. Who has the mic? Come yes, here, sir. I worked evangelism for quite a few years in Texas and Louisiana and Arkansas and Welcome. Alaska. Mm -hmm. And each and every time that I stood with someone and they accepted Jesus Christ and were baptized, I was happy to see them accept Christ. Amen. So the same way. Well, if we get into the kingdom, we see people that we work with, and they'll be there. We'll be happy. Amen. That is so true. That, that is a joyful thing right there. Because, there, you know, if, 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 we, if we lose anyone to this world, it's going to be hurtful. This is why it's going to take us time in heaven to get over all that. Because he's going to have to wipe away those tears. You think there won't be tears if, if your loved ones or your friends or whatever are lost? There's going to be tears. It's going to be pain, excruciating pain. Would any one of us like to make it by ourselves, alone? None of us will make it alone, I'll be honest with you. Right. Unless we avail ourselves in our neighborhoods, mm -hmm. wherever we work. Mm-hmm of sharing this gospel by the lives in which we choose to live. Right. And trying to show those, the, this, these people that don't know anything about Jesus, that Jesus is real mm -hmm. and he's coming soon. Unless we do that with all of our efforts, we'll never see the kingdom myself. I agree. I totally agree. Okay. So number four says, what did, did anyone have an, any other comment? I'm sorry. Okay. Number four, what did the prophet see in the vision? Can someone read that, please? Verse two. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. Okay. So let's do a little digging into this one. When we think about four winds, what do we think about? Strife. Okay, so strife. And if, if they're stroving upon the great sea, what does that mean? It means that the strife is, is going all over every many people. Okay. It's contending. It's in opposition, right? Yes. Striving against it. Affecting many okay. people. And when we think about that, what do we think the great sea? What is the great sea? People. People, right? Yes. But when the Bible talks about the great sea, what, what, what was that great sea, if you think about it? Does anyone know? Seas and Bible prophecy represent... Uh, multitudes, peoples, and tongues. Exactly. 
That's and Revelation 17, verse 15. Right. And when I looked this up, the great sea also, it actually, biblically, it's the Mediterranean Sea. And if you think about where the Mediterranean Sea is located, it's located where these kingdoms are, in that general area. So there was strife, there was contention mm -hmm. in that area with those people. Amen. If you think about it that way, too. So that, to me, was very interesting because I'm thinking the Great Sea, the Great Sea. The Great Sea is the Mediterranean Sea. It's talking about the people in that area, in that region, mm -hmm. okay? strove against, there was war, there was strife, there was contention. Mm -hmm. And as a result, kingdoms rose and fell, Amen. depending on who was the strongest. And if you note here, we have gold, we have what? Silver, we have brass, brass. and iron, and iron. then we have a mixture of iron and clay. Like, as was pointed out last, last week by Pastor Chris, the value of these, this multi-metallic uh, image decreases, but the strength of the nations increase. Bear mm. that in mind as we move forward. Mm. Okay. Um, the people, this is just a note. The people in each controlling nation were different. The laws and customs were different, and even the administration of the kingdoms were different, as Pastor pointed out. Moving to question number six. So now we're getting into, I'm going to say, the veggie meat of the, of the, uh, of this lesson. What did these four beasts represent? I know we already spoke about it. Can someone read that for me? Number six, and the note under it. Do I have a reader? Mm -hmm. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. And the note says, the word kings here, as in Daniel 2, verse 44, denotes kingdoms as explained in verses 23 and 24 of the seventh chapter, the two words being used interchangeably in this prophecy. So basically, we learn here that these four beasts, which we know based on this image, each of which correlate, each section or each kingdom correlates to the beast that Daniel saw in his vision, represents kings or kingdoms, correct? Okay. These, as we spoke about earlier, were um, each kingdom, each successive kingdom, gained victories through war and strife, and, and just sometimes even just gruesome behavior. So as we keep that in mind, we will continue by saying that, and number seven, in symbolic language, what is represented by the winds? We already talked about that. Strife, war, commotion, okay? The winds denote strife and war, which is evident from the vision itself. As a result of the striving of the winds, kingdoms rise and fall. So as a result of war, bloodshed, uh, as they conquer the kingdom, they, um, these kingdoms rise and fall. So... This also happens to revolutions and political strife as well. Is there any political strife going on today? Oh, yes. Well, somebody tell me what's happening right now. If you watch the news, even if you don't watch it, you, you're going to hear about it somewhere on Facebook or wherever. Well, you have uh, Syria is under uh, constant attack mm -hmm. through different nations trying to bring in the so-called peace through mm -hmm. war. Okay. And you have also uh, other nations like uh, Japan or, or what is it, Japan? Korea. Mm -hmm. Korea threatening people. North Korea. Yeah. Now, what kind of country is North Korea? Uh, what kind of government is North Korea? Let's put it that way. Communism. Communism. 
Did anybody see this week that our now president complimented him as being this great leader mm -hmm. and one that basically can control his people, correct? Which he too wants to do. He wants, when he speaks, his people to sit up and take notice, okay? Yeah. He wants them to jump when he says boo, it's not gonna happen. okay? Which is evident from the way he's governed so far. Pastor Phillips. I was gonna simply say is that based on what we had already discussed earlier, is that we see the type of uh, government that was utilized by King Nebuchadnezzar mm -hmm. is being reflected in certain uh, world leaders today. Mm -hmm. Kim Jong-un of North Korea, mm -hmm. he is a dictator. Mm. But, but see, he's not the only one. Right. And so you have various countries in the Middle East mm -hmm. and in Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. Russia, mm -hmm. a dictator, mm -hmm. Vladimir Putin. Mm -hmm. so, so nothing is new under the sun. Right. And so for the U.S. president to acknowledge that, that simply shows you he's, a, he's already given indication or signs that he wants to uh, resemble uh, that style of government. He wants a military parade. Yes. Uh, he wants to be worshipped. He, he feels he's above the law. And he won't and, go anywhere unless he has that, right. you know, those, those apartments. And so again, all this in the accolades. Bible, God is revealing the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men. Amen. All Amen. right. So God is in control. Right. Uh, uh, what we see uh, happening is, uh, is simply a consequence of prior disobedience. Mm. And so God is giving what you asked for, mm -hmm. all right? right? And so the country is suffering from this ungodly leadership. Mm -hmm. So do you see any of the customs of Babylon being displayed, other than what you talked about, in our country today? What do we see? Dictatorship, we see what? What kind of worship? I mean, there's every... I don't, how many denominations are there? How, ma how many religious organizations are there in this country? Does anybody have an idea? How many what now? How many religious entities exist in this country today? Oh, uh, there are over 700 different religious groups here in the United States. It is also estimated that there are some nearly 2,000 different religious persuasions worldwide. And that's because, remember now, Satan wants to be worshipped. He doesn't care how he goes about it. Mm -hmm. As long as you violate the first commandment. <laughs> what's the first commandment? Thou shalt have no other, other gods, gods before, before me. me. So you have many gods in many different forms, mm. all right, mm -hmm. that do not acknowledge the one and only true God. Right. And so that's what we see happening in the world today. Once you set aside the Bible, Mm. as the inspired word of God, that means you have to come up with something to replace it. Right. Okay? Right. No matter what it is. And it may have some good qualities to it. Yeah. But it's truth, not the word of God. Truth mixed with error, yeah. Absolutely. So if truth is mixed with error, what does that make that particular information? Error. All error, All right? All error. Because cause darkness and light, can it exist? Can, can it cannot coexist? Exist. Cannot exist. He makes it palatable, yeah, because, you know, as people say, the cliche, sin is sweet, okay, and we're drawn in that direction, but what keeps us grounded, though? What is it that keeps us grounded? Truth. It's truth, and how do we obtain truth? The Word of God. Because faith comes by what? Hearing. And hearing by the Word of God. Amen. Okay, I'm going to uh, pretty much skip the note there, and I'm going down to number eight. We already talked about what is symbolized by waters, peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to move ahead. And it's, pardon me if I'm moving a little fast, but we want to go to the first beast. So let's go to number nine, okay? Let's talk about that because there's some interesting notes here to consider when we talk about Babylon or Babylon. Okay, can someone read number nine if you have a mic there? Please. The first, the first was like a lion, and had eagle's wings. Nope. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, mm. and it was lifted up from the earth, 
and may stand upon the feet as a man. And the man's heart was given to it. Daniel 7, 4. Okay. All right. Pastor, did you want to say something before I elaborate? Yeah. Um, um, it, the question was, what was the first beast like? Mm -hmm. And the issue is image worship. Mm -hmm. Man wants to be worshipped. Right. This is what Nebuchadnezzar wanted. Uh, wanted. Mm -hmm. Even uh, and 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 he what he was he clear. What would he do if he didn't get that worship? What, what, what was what was his what, what? How did he handle that if he wasn't worshipped? I mean, we have something like that going on right now. If he wasn't worshipped, what what was his next move? Well, his thing was death. If if you don't obey my word, this is what's going to happen to you. So, do you see the stage being set right now for that to happen? Absolutely. Later because on. See, See, even again, uh, in Daniel 4, mm -hmm. you see God steps in and reveals to King Nebuchadnezzar who really is in control. Mm. And he took away his mental faculties. <laughs> How long? <laughs> mm, as a wild beast. So it's no wonder he's depicted here as a beast, correct? Okay. But, <laughs> okay. but what happened to him? Okay, let's, let's pick this apart a little. Three things happened. Wings were plucked. Instead of being on four feet, now he's on two, okay? And a man's heart was given to him. Okay, so let's just start with the wings being plucked versus him being grounded, okay? A wings, having wings versus being grounded. Okay, what do you think that would do to his conquering ability and his leadership ability? Okay? It's depleted, right? Is it not depleted? I mean, if you have wings, you can move pretty fast, correct? Okay, but when those wings are taken away, what happens? You're grounded. It's like grounded. an airplane. Exactly. You take the wings away, what's going to happen? Yes. It won't fly. That's right. It, will it have any speed to it? No. And then, let's say you're running on all fours, okay? Then all of a sudden, because you have this tremendous speed with these wings and all, now you're only on two. What's going to happen with that as well? What happens? What happens to that kingdom? What happens to the ability to conquer other kingdoms? What happens to the ability? Yes, Sister Phillips? In my moment of excitement, I just said that it falls. You're, on, you, you're, you're used to walking on all fours. Now you're on two. So you're, you're unstable, right? right you're unstable. You have to get used to that because it's like, man, it's like a baby when it's first starting to walk, right? It's just like all over the place. It can't get its footing. And what I add is that the kingdom of Babylon was the greatest kingdom that there ever was. Exactly. That was my next And point. as a matter of fact, uh, when Daniel receives the information, uh, and well, excuse me, when King Nebuchadnezzar receives the information in Daniel 2, mm -hmm. uh, his kingdom is the kingdom of gold. Right. Gold is superior. Yes. And his kingdom is used as a symbol mm -hmm. of end time events. So because the name Babylon is going to be mentioned in end time issues. Right. So, so we don't want to forget that particular point as well. Okay. All right. Now let's talk about his heart. First, he had the heart of a lion, right? What is the heart of a lion like? Can anyone expound on that? What is the heart of a lion? Fearless. Courageous. Brave. Okay. Courageous, brave, and strong. So now he has this heart of a man. No wings, two, two legs, or two feet. And now a man's heart. So what is a man's heart capable of? Wicked continually. Okay. <laughs> now, that's true. That's very true. It is wicked. We, I mean, we were born in sin, shaping in iniquity. We don't have to stay that way, but that's, that's the way we are. That's our nature. But God can give us a, a, a new heart, right? Okay. So saying that it's wicked, which is true, it can also be reached by God. Now he has the heart of a man, okay? So it's a heart that can feel. It's a heart that can have compassion. 
It's a heart that can be reached by the Holy Spirit, correct? So as we keep that in mind, so is it with us today. God says he will give us a new heart. He'll put it in us, you know, here. So because he's now reachable, what happened to Nebuchadnezzar as a result of having this man's heart? He taught him. He humbled him, right? He was humble. But in the end, what did Nebuchadnezzar do? Correct. Because God reached his heart of a man. He reached that heart, right? Because he gave him a new heart. Even though he took a, that, that courageous heart was gone. But he was more humble now. He was able to hear what God had to say. Go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to say, uh, personally speaking, I have a, a major problem with the, the gentleman in the White House. <laughs> mm, you no, and a lot a, of others. A, a major problem. Mm -hmm. But when we, when we think about it, we need to pray for the brother. True. Because it's like we just said, Nebuchadnezzar's heart was changed. Mm -hmm. this so too heart, can his. This brother's heart can be changed. Right. And so we can never lose sight of that. Uh, Brother Scott, yeah. because for the simple reason that we look at some people, yeah. see, God looks at the heart. We look at some people and say, oh, no, uh -uh, never. Yeah. They're never going to change, That's blah, right. blah, blah. These people are going to be in heaven, yeah. okay? We're going to say, wow, yeah. you know? Yeah. So we can never, ever give up yeah. on anyone exactly. because we're not God. That's right. It's not for us to determine who's going to be in heaven and who's exactly. not. Exactly. We just better try to be there ourselves. Exactly. Marcy. The doc, um, he brought up a good point because, you know, when you're on social media <laughs> and you see all these different negative things going on about police brutality and Trump is doing this and saying that, you start to develop a hatred in your heart, although you don't want to. Mm -hmm. um, I guess it's like a human nature type of thing. but. What I had to do was distance myself from watching certain things mm -hmm. as far as the news is concerned. You had to filter out some things. Precisely, huh? like because I said, Lord, this was just last week, matter of fact. <laughs> I said, Lord, I don't want to develop hatred in my heart against offer police officers or Donald Trump mm -hmm. because God loves unconditionally. Mm -hmm. And although these people may not be doing the things that they're supposed to be doing, and mm -hmm. you, see, you see and hear so much um, you know, stuff going on, he doesn't love the sinner, but he, lo I mean, he, he doesn't love the sin, but he loves the sinner. True, Marcy. So we still have to, I mean, if we consider ourselves as Christians, mm -hmm. and maybe some of us need to really understand what that, what that word, the definition of it really is, mm -hmm. is honestly being Christ-like, right. we have to still love him. Mm -hmm. we, we may not appreciate everything, you know, um, agree with what he's saying or what he's doing, and I don't think most of us do, but we still have to love this man, Mr. Trump, and we, ha we have to pray for him, mm -hmm. pray for our, our nation, pray for ourselves, because me, for one, I don't want to miss out on the kingdom of heaven. Have an animosity in your yes, heart. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it will be ridiculous. Right. One point I want to make before we move forward, and I'm going to let Pastor Phillips speak his piece. Um, when we talk about Babylon, and we talk about the descendants of, and I have to touch on this, and, you know, we, every, we have to, when we study the Bible, it's every single word is important in the Bible Amen. because we've been learning how to study the Bible through Pastor Chris and others in here as well. Um, who was the father of, of the Babylonians? Based on Noah's sons, I don't want you to go deep down, but do we remember? Was it Ham, Shem, or Japheth? Which one? It's not on the board, but we should know this by now. If you don't know this by now, then, you know, you can still learn it. I'm not going to say you'll never know. You can still learn. Because I'm going to teach you right now. Okay. It was Ham, remember? And 
it was the grandson, what? Nimrod, correct? He was the father of the Babylonians. So let's keep that in sight as we go down through this. And we're going to be running out of time soon. So I just want to pretty much just mention before we move forward, when we talk about Medes and Persians, these people are related right here. All these are related, in fact. But when we, when we go right here, we're talking about whose tribe? Okay, and, and, and what? Ham, Sham, Japheth, who? Do we know? Japheth, okay. In fact, the, the, the remaining ones are pretty much Japheth. So let's remember that. A lot of, a lot of, the, a lot of these tribes were, were ver really, I mean tribes, these nations were really vicious, okay, like barbaric, a lot of them. So we keep that in mind. This is why God symbolized these heathen nations as beasts, because their characters were beast-like. The way they did things were, was beast-like. The way they carried out even their worship services a lot of times were beasts like cutting themselves and just doing various things, sacrificing children and babies and, you know, different things. So let's keep that in mind as we move forward. Pastor, what did you have to say? Okay. Let's move on to the next kingdom. I just wanted to point that out because we've been studying, you know, about Ham, Shem, and Japheth. So I just wanted to point that out, that these individuals are related. The Medes and the Persians intermarried, okay? Uh, so they were marrying like first cousins and things of that nature. So this is why they teamed up, because they were related and they were married. They came from the same exact group of people. Let's keep that in mind, okay? So I'm just trying to tie everything together so that we stay focused. Now... By what was the second kingdom symbolized? Does anyone know? A bear. And, w and what was unique about this bear? We've seen, we, I mean, I've seen bears up in the, in the Pennsylvania mountains when I was on drill weekend, and the bear is looking down at me, and I'm looking up at it, and I'm <laughs> on the firing range, and I'm like, please don't come down here, because I'm not playing with you. I have this weapon right now. But anyway, so... What, what's unique about this bear? Can somebody tell me, enlighten me a little bit? Okay. According to the scriptures, that the bear had three ribs in its mouth. Mm. And a bear is a ferocious creature. Mm -hmm. It destroys much flesh. Right. And the three ribs in its mouth denotes the conquering of Babylon, Syria, and Egypt. Exactly. So, but at the same time, the bear symbolized, when you look at the Medes and the Persians, and you get into Daniel chapter uh, 6, mm -hmm. uh, rigid law. Mm -hmm. that the law of the Medes and Persians. In other words, when they made a law, it couldn't be changed. Right. And there is the fourth beast, which I'm sure you'll get into. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, adopts that same principle, rigid exactly. law. Exactly. That it cannot change. Right. Whatever it says. Is, is law. Is like, law. Like we're, we're headed in that direction right, right. now with our, with our government. But speaking about that trickle-down effect with the laws and customs and religious beliefs, et cetera, by the time it got down here, it was so, that's why we have iron, because it was so embedded and all of this trickled down to here that, like you said, there was no changing. It was like, what I say is law, because I have already set myself up as this supreme being, so it can't change. And if you do try to go against me, there will be consequences, very severe consequences. And we may not get time to get to that today, but next Sabbath we'll go into more detail. Go ahead, Pastor. I want to qu quickly mention about uh, Greece. Mm -hmm. One yes. of the things about uh, the leopard, mm -hmm. and, you know, of course it has the four wings. Right. Uh, denoting Alexander, and then his, yes. you know, he dies his, and, and then gives his, his kingdom to his over. four generals. Mm -hmm. But Greece is known for knowledge, myths. Yeah. Yes. traditions yes because that same uh government 
influences what we do today. Exactly. As a matter of fact, the names of the days of the week, yes. the names of the month, mm -hmm. and even some holidays that we practice yes. came from that mythology. Greek mythology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So true. That is, that is very poignant to point out um, and very crucial that we remember that. So moving on, um, we already talked about what the three ribs in the mouth represented. And also that the fact that it, it favored one side indicated that one of these two, being Medo-Persia, was stronger than the other. Does anyone know which one was the strongest? I think the Persian was stronger the Persians. Than, than the, the Persians Medes. were stronger than the Medes. Okay, so I, I just want to point that out. So when you see that bear lifted up on one side is favoring that one side because the other side is weaker. It's just like if you have a bad leg. You're going to favor that side, you know. So, in other words, you want to protect it. That's what that means. So, basically, that um, Medes, were, Medes were weaker than the uh, Persians. I just wanted to point that out. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, also, just to mention, Persians really like to worship things like um, the mountains, the earth, the wind, um, the water, things in nature. Th that's really where, where their focus was. Uh, okay, let's move on quickly and touch on Greece just a little bit. Uh, Pastor already talked about that, a lot of their mythology. Um, so, and he also just went, really went into, um, he talked about, Alexander the Great, and it's Alexander, when he was dying, he said uh, to his, um, his generals, asked him who was to take the kingdom and rule, and his reply was, to the strongest. Mm -hmm. So he moved it on to his generals, okay? I just wanted to point out something because we're running out of time. I want to read this because I think this is crucial. This is still from um, the story of Daniel the prophet, um, 94.1. There was a time when the Roman Empire had the most wonderful opportunity to, to accept the true God. Rome was a universal kingdom during the life of Christ. Think about it. Christ was right there with them, okay? So to Babylon, God sent his people, the Jews, okay? They were, they were right there in the midst, mm -hmm. to scatter the truths of his kingdom and lead men to repentance. The Medes and the Persians received the gospel from this same people because the same individuals were there during that time period. Daniel's one of them. Okay. And it says that, um, and the representatives from Greece came to Jerusalem into the very temple in touch with the priests in order that there might be no excuse for their refusing Christ. But to the Roman kingdom, heaven itself was poured out in the person of our Lord and Savior. And it was Rome that, think about this, nailed him to the cross. It was Rome that sealed his tomb. And it was Rome that guarded his grave. The earthly church suffered persecution at the hands of this same power. Mm -hmm. Judgment came to Rome when these barbarians overran the empire with fire and sword, and the kingdom was divided into ten parts. Okay, and I'm going to close there because I'm out of time, sorry. But I'll pick up next week. And I hope that you all received a blessing from the lesson. And thank Amen. you all for your fine Amen. participation. Yes. And may God continue to work with us as we uh, continue to draw a correlation between this image, these beasts, and our time today. May God richly bless each of, each of you as we continue in the services for today. I'm going to say a word of closing prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for these Sabbath school lessons, Lord. We thank you for prophecy. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the history of the Bible. Lord, we thank you for the inspired word from the pen of inspiration. We ask, Lord, that you would be in our hearts and help us to be the individuals you have us to be as we move into the sacred service for this morning. Bless our pastor and his family and the church family here and all those watching online. We thank you all um, for all your goodness, your love, and your mercy. Be with us and forgive us of our sins and shortcomings and help us to come upon higher ground each and every day as we dwell into your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.